we have Werner Studios down in uh, New Zealand who would have a high reservation of an equivalent plant and, and then they would understand where that was placed, why it was placed there. So there was the ambiguity that existed in, in, that exists in a, 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 a traditional pre viz pipeline and the frustration that, it, that, that stems from multiple iterations trying to ask for a very specific thing like a plant to be moved and then have to re-render the whole process. We took care of all in the, in, within the virtual production. So when we handed off our files, there are unique transforms for every single element that's in that file and it, it travels downstream. Yeah, so therefore it can be reconstructed at the end. And again, whilst that seems relatively boring, um, that, is a, that was a huge deal. Uh, I mean, that handled this amount of files, this amount of options. Well, what we'll do next is we'll show you how this is made, how, how we get to the template phase, but we'll do it in sections from the capture phase on. But ultimately our end goal, whilst you know, you, we have to worry about what ends up on the screen uh, from a, from a be-all end-all standpoint, the beautiful images are not the first thing we, we have to worry about. It's, it's one telling narrative, narrative story, stories at the forefront of everything that Jim does, which is even within how plants are, are constructed and you know what the, what the botany is involved in, 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 in within each of those plants. The level of detail we went to was, was uh, pretty pretty fierce. Um, I think we uh, I think that that pretty much explains assets. If I don't know if we have questions, we want to or we want to save all questions to the end. It's up to you. <laughs> I'll take that as a no. I have one question. Yeah. One question. Okay. Um, oh, sure. It has to has to pertain to assets because <laughs> there's more to come. I promise. Um, concerning. Uh, when these shots were, were taken, you, you were generating that in real time, and James Cameron could watch that um, kind, of, kind of on the director floor. Is that right? Um, I remember reading a Wired article that explained some of this. Were the actors able to see this while, while they were? Yes, we, we'll talk about that. <laughs> we'll talk about the division of, of sort of the, the, the virtual production. We'll go through the steps. And uh, when we shoot live, these cameras are not necessarily not necessarily indicative of the A cameras, the cameras we shot at the time. Right. When we capture the performance, we do we are live. It's, it's in some ways it's like a confidence monitor. We we we're assured that not only did we get the shot, but technically we we got all the data and we understand the overall composition of a scene. You know, you can't cut an edit sequence with a single camera, even though we we, we pick off a lot of cameras. When we capture the performance, we. Uh, we have a, a live feedback, so they can see and understand how they're interacting with the environment. I think it was an incredibly important part of having them, to, having them as actors to be immersed in that environment. One, they're in a relatively sterile environment because of the, the nature of capture. But I think what, what separates us from what, what had been done before, and, and Miles talked forward to the, the real-time aspect of this, is the fact that we could go real-time. They, they did, you know, not just only imagine the world that they're in, they had a visual reference to what that is, so they could, they, they could with full confidence, act out their parts, you know. Uh, and it, it's interesting because the actors, we had a, a varying degree of uh, sort of likes, don't like, some people loved it, some actors loved it, some didn't like it at all at the beginning. And what was interesting is those who were, who were uncomfortable with the process felt that it wasn't like real acting, uh, like C.C. Pounder's a good example. She had a hard time warming the process, but by the time we got done, she thought this was the ultimate be all end all of, of stage, uh, you know, acting. You know, it's it, any world, anywhere, anytime. You know, so. Uh, and the key to that is for her to see the result of her performance on the character. Once she made that connection, she understood the process. And once she understood, she knew how to take that information and apply that to the performance. So, uh, to your question, this was a key part of the process. That all the CG elements and the whole real-time prep that we did for this template that we're going to take you through, that was a huge part of this whole virtual production paradigm that, that we're going to go through today. Because the one thing that Jim was adamant about is making that connection between the world, the characters, and the performance on the stage. So that, that was really central uh, to this whole process. Great. Thank you. Okay. you can do yes. So, so okay. I'll take this one. What's that? I can play that game. Oh. <laughs> He's like, well, I'm calling it. Yeah. So, we talked about the assets. So, this is really what the stage looks like. This is a nice snapshot of, of what happens on a typical capture day. You can see there's a lot going on here. Uh, Jim is actually 
center screen just left with our back, with his back to us, and he's seeing um, the lower right of the, the monitor there, the bottom right, that's the real-time display. So that's actually the output of his virtual camera. So this is an example of the connection between what's happening on the stage and the end result of all of that in that image on the screen there. So you can see there's, there's a lot of stuff going on besides just capture here. You've got stunt support, grip support, special effects. Those guys up top of those long tubes are actually wind blowers. Because this scene is from uh, the landing of the Samson when the avatars first discovered Pandora. So they're getting out. And so Jim wanted that wind to come down just like a chopper would to affect their performance. And it really did have a big impact. So the point here is on the technology side, we can't just be able to shoot uh, in ideal conditions in a lab setting. This is real production where there may be five, six, ten people out there that have nothing to do with the actual performance directly, but they have a lot to do indirectly to enhance that performance or to facilitate it. So it's very important that they can do their job on the stage and the actors can still perform do what they need to do, much like a live action shoot. But we have the benefit here, of course, of having these people do their job without being seen because we're not actually capturing them, we're just on the stage. So our system has to track all that information, the markers on the performers, reconstruct that, and re retarget that in real time. So I, this is a, a really gives you an idea of how robust the system has to be in the production conditions that it has to endure on a typical day. There's multiple scale in here as well. Get That's right, let's see if I can get them out. So right here you see a child on the stage, she's actually filling a part of uh, a human, and just a stand-in, but scale reference, the relationship between the Navis and avatars to human is about 60%, uh, was it roughly? Yeah, it is. A, we use an inverse scale of 167. We, what we found early was we tried to define the physical characters in design, in the design phase, and what we realized very quickly is we needed to carry the, the physicality of the actor uh, in order to have a, some truth to the performance. So what we did instead was we took all of the actors once they were cast and multiplied their dimensions by 1.67 or the height specifically and then augmented their performance from there. Uh, and the inverse of that is basically CD and 59 cents. So uh, again, that's roughly the, the, the scales we were working with. Yeah. So another big part of the capture besides having to be robust and stay in those conditions is the accuracy. And because this was essentially a live action movie with a lot of visual effects and animation integrated, these characters had to appear real in a live world, in a world that we all know, so we understand the rules, we understand the physics, and everything that goes into making something look believable. So we, this couldn't be an animated character. It, otherwise, it, it kind of breaks the connection with the audience. And so Jim was adamant about making these, these, these Navis and avatars look like living, breathing creatures that could live and act and perform alongside real actors. And so what you're going to see here is an example of the detail that we had to capture and, uh, from the performers and apply to the characters. So this is actually a scene, scene 53, where uh, the Terry first discovers Jake. So what you're going to see is the, the shot of a live actor and then intercut with the CG render version. Incidentally, this is the first, first scene we've turned over. Um, so the, you'll see there's multiple stages, uh, there's multiple suits, multiple head rigs. All of the technology, uh, all of the steps we, we had along the way were evolving. So I think this scene went through two or three separate pickups over a two and a half year period. So there's, you'll, you, you can watch out for some detail. You'll see there's head, head rig changes, uh, suit changes, and then even the images that you see at the end, the uh, CG version of the template. That was a very crude or a very early version for us. But again, we went, as hung up on the imagery as, as where the technical details of, of, of being able to create these files and have them to go downstream. Once we resolved that, once we solved that, we were able to concentrate on uh, heightening the, uh, the quality. 